Okay, let's unpack this. OpenAI has just launched Codex, a brand new cloud-based software engineering agent. Sounds pretty advanced, doesn't it? It certainly does. Uh, essentially, Codex is designed to be a, well, a powerful assistant for software developers. It can tackle a whole range of coding tasks. Like adding another coder to the team almost. Kind of, yeah. An incredibly capable one. And this isn't just theoretical, right? It's actually out there. Oh, yeah. Available right now for ChatGPT Pro, Team, and Enterprise users. And plus, subscribers should be getting access uh, pretty soon, too. Right. So if you're listening and you build software, or maybe you're just interested in where AI is going in you know, this critical field, this deep dive is definitely for you. We want to give you the essential info on this uh, significant new tool, and quickly. Exactly. We've been looking closely at OpenAI's own announcement about Codex. Our mission today is pretty straightforward. Figure out what Codex really is, how you actually use it, and you know why it might be such a big deal for software engineering. All right, let's get down to it then. What is Codex? It's got more than just fancy autocomplete, I imagine. Oh, much more. The word agent is really important here. They call it a cloud-based software engineering agent that implies um, a level of autonomy, it can handle multiple things at once, not just suggesting the next line. So it can take on whole tasks, like delegation. Precisely. Think delegation. And what's powering it? What's the brain, so to speak? That would be Codex 1. It's a special version of OpenAI's O3 model. Now, the O series models, those are their big foundational language models. And O3 was already pre-capable. Codex 1 is specifically fine-tuned for software engineering tasks. Okay, fine-tuned how? Well, what's really interesting is how it was trained. They used reinforcement learning um, based on tons of real-world coding tasks and data. This means it doesn't just generate code that works, but code that often looks like how a human would write it. It even tries to match preferences for things like pull request styles. That human style bit is key, hopefully less of that really dense, uh, slightly alien AI code we sometimes see. Exactly. And it's not just writing code, right? You mentioned instructions and tests. Yeah, the announcement mentioned that. Right. It's built to follow instructions quite closely. You give it a job, it tries to do exactly that. And crucially, it can run tests iteratively. That feedback loop running tests, seeing failures, trying again, that's a big step towards making AI more reliable for actual development work. Okay, so that's the what. How does someone actually you know, use this thing day to day? It lives inside ChatGPT. Yep, it's right there in the ChatGPT sidebar. If you've got a coding task, you type in your prompt, hit the code button, or if you just want to ask something about your code, there's an ask function too. And when I hit code, what happens? Does it start messing with files on my laptop? No, and that's the cloud-based part, really important. Each task runs in its own separate, isolated cloud sandbox. Think of it like a secure little workshop just for that task. It gets preloaded with your project's repo, so it has the context. Ah, okay, so it's isolated, safe. Right, it can't touch your local files until you specifically say, okay, that sounds sensible. So inside this sandbox, what can it actually do? Read files? Write them? Both. It can read and edit files in the repo, obviously needed for fixing bugs or adding features. But it can also run commands, things like test harnesses, you know, linters for code style, type checkers, the usual dev tools. OK, so it's not just writing code. It's trying to write good code following standards and checking its work. How long does a typical task take? The announcement says typically between uh, 1 and 30 minutes. Depends on the complexity, of course. Well, I can see what it's doing. Yeah, you can monitor the progress in real time, no black boxes. So task done. What do I get back? Just a diff. It's more than that. It commits its changes within that sandbox environment first. And then, crucially, it gives you verifiable evidence, like citations from the terminal log showing the commands it ran and the output from any tests it executed. Evidence, huh? That sounds um. important for trust being able to see its work. Absolutely vital. That transparency lets you understand how it got to the solution. Okay, I review the evidence, the code. What then? What are my choices? Several options. You look at the changes. If you want tweaks, you can ask for revisions. If it looks good, you can actually open a pull request, say on GitHub, directly from the interface. Makes integration pretty smooth. Feels like it slots right into a normal workflow. That's the idea. Now, you mentioned configuring the environment and something about agents.md files, what's that about? Right, the environment configuration lets you set things up so the sandbox closely matches your real development environment, helps with consistency. And the agents.md files, those are interesting. They're basically markdown files you can put in your repo, like a readm 
You use them to tell Codex specific things about your project, how it's structured, what commands to use for tests, any specific coding standards you follow, like giving it a little cheat sheet for your project. A project cheat sheet for the AI. Mm. Does it need those files to work well? Well, interestingly, OpenAI says Codex 1 actually performs strongly even without those files or other custom setups based on their tests. So they definitely help it align better with your project specifics, but it seems pretty capable out of the box, too. That's good to know. Less setup friction. Yeah. Okay, let's talk performance. How well does it actually code? They shared some numbers, right? They did. Two main benchmarks. First, SWE Bench Verified. That's a known public benchmark for real-world software problems. They compared Codex 1 to their previous high-end model, O3 High. The difference was pretty stark. Codex 1 hit around 70% accuracy across different attempts. O3 High was down at like 11%. Wow, 11% to 70%. That's yeah. not a small improvement. That's a huge jump. It really is. It suggests a major step up in handling these practical coding challenges. And what about their own internal tests? They have an internal set of tasks, real stuff their engineers face. On that benchmark, Codex 1 got about 80% accuracy. Just for comparison, they showed other models. O1 high got 0%, O4 mini high got 40%, and O3 high, the previous best, was at 75%. So 80% is again a noticeable lead. They mentioned context length and reasoning effort too. Why are those details significant? Okay, context length, that's how much info the model can juggle at once. They tested Codex 1 with 192,000 tokens. That's quite large meaning it can handle bigger code bases, more complex instructions? Exactly. A token is roughly like a word or part of a word. So 192K lets it see a lot of context. And medium reasoning effort, that's about how much computational power it uses to think. It's the default setting, balancing speed, and how deeply it analyzes the problem. Got it. And there was a small note about excluding some samples from one benchmark. Yeah, for SW Bench Verified, they had to skip 23 samples because of some internal infrastructure limits. Just something to keep in mind, benchmarks are snapshots. Real-world mileage may vary. Fair enough. Always caveats with benchmarks. Now, moving on to something crucial, safety and trust. When AI starts writing code, mm -hmm. people get nervous. Understandably so. OpenAI is stressing this is a research preview. That's their usual approach. Deploy carefully, learn, iterate. Security and transparency were apparently big design priorities. We already talked about the verifiable outputs, the logs, the test results. That's key for trust. Right. Seeing the work. What if it gets stuck? Or the tests fail? Does it just give up? No. It's designed to communicate that. If it's uncertain or tests are failing, it's supposed to tell you, so you can guide it or make a decision. But, and this is important, they strongly recommend humans always review and validate the code. So it's an assistant, a powerful one, but not autonomous. Human oversight is still essential. Absolutely. It augments. It doesn't replace. What about the style of the code? You mentioned it tries to mimic human style. Yeah, that was a specific training goal. Aligning the output with human preferences and best practices, they explicitly say Codex 1 produces cleaner, more readable code compared to the older O3 model. That makes review and integration much easier for teams. That makes a huge difference in practice. Uh -huh. Easier collaboration. Yep. Okay, the flip side. Misuse. What about stopping someone from using this to, say, build malware? Critical point. They directly address this. Codex is trained to identify and refuse malicious requests, like generating harmful software. But they've also tried to make sure these safety filters don't block legitimate uses, even if they involve, you know, low-level stuff that could theoretically be misused. That sounds like walking a tightrope. How do they manage that balance? They mention stronger policy frameworks and rigorous safety evaluations. They even put out an addendum to the O3 system card detailing these safety checks. It seems like they're taking it seriously. Good. Proactive safety is crucial. And the execution environment, you mentioned the sandbox. Any other security details? Yeah, the key thing is that during task execution, internet access inside that secure cloud container is completely disabled. Its interaction is strictly limited to the code you provide from GitHub and any dependencies you set up. So it can't call out to random websites or APIs while it's working? Nope. <laughs> no access to external websites, APIs, nothing. That isolation is a core security feature. Okay, this all sounds impressive in theory. Has OpenAI actually been, like, dogfooding this? Yeah. Using it internally? They have. Their own engineers have started using Codex. They're finding it really useful for offloading repetitive tasks. Things like code refactoring, renaming stuff consistently across a project, writing unit tests, the bread and butter stuff that eats up time. Yeah, those tasks can really break your flow. What else are they using it for? Also for more creative starting points, scaffolding new features, 
wiring components together, fixing simpler bugs, even drafting documentation. Interesting. So it's actually changing how they work. The announcement mentioned new habits. Yeah, they're seeing engineers use it to triage on-call issues faster, for example, what? or plan out tasks at the start of the day, offloading some background work. The idea is it reduces context switching, helps surface forgotten tasks, lets them ship faster, and keeps engineers focused on the hard problems. Hmm. Okay, so let's try and wrap this up. To summarize this deep dive, Codex looks like a pretty major development in AI for software engineering. It's not just generating code snippets. It's an agent designed to handle whole tasks securely and with ways to verify its work. That's a great summary. And for you listening, hopefully this gives you a solid grasp of a new tool that uh, really could change how software gets built. It's rolling out now, so it's not science fiction. Which brings us to that final thought to chew on. How might tools like this fundamentally change software teams? collaboration, even what it means to be a software engineer down the line. Right. And maybe even more exciting, what completely new things could we build? What innovations become possible when engineers have assistants like Codex? Things we can't even quite imagine yet. Definitely a lot to think about there.